Hey, hello and thank you for joining us. My name is Eric Hudson. I'm the Product Marketing Manager for Azure SQL Database. And today I'm joined by Morgan Oslake. Thanks for having me, Eric. Absolutely, who is the uh, Program Manager on our SQL Database Engineering team. And today we're going to talk about how you can cost-effectively ensure great database performance when your workloads are perhaps a little infrequent or even highly unpredictable. You know, Morgan, when we talk to developers, we hear a lot about all the, the great experiences that they're building for their users, but one of the challenges that they face is really ensuring that there's enough capacity or resources on tap in order to support the apps they're building. Yeah, uh, great point, Eric. There's sort of at least two situations um, that face developers. One is uh, what to do about sizing new applications mm -hmm. um, that don't have any usage history. Right. Um, the second, as you alluded to, is even for apps that are deployed and running, mm -hmm. um, they may exhibit uh, usage patterns that are somewhat intermittent and unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And so that becomes a real challenge in terms of balancing the trade-off between price and performance. Mm -hmm. Some examples of these kind of applications uh, could include line of business apps, mm -hmm. um, could include dev test databases, content management systems, the list goes on, but what's really important um, is the usage pattern in terms of evaluating which compute tier to use within SQL DB. Yeah, and you know, the last time I checked, developers really don't want to have to deal with the, all of the um, the uh, the complexity around trying to manage these resources and such. They just want to continue to focus on building that app and and pleasing their customers. So, Morgan, how are we helping customers with the types of workloads that we just talked about? Yep, so in SQL DB there's two compute tiers. Mm -hmm. There's the provision compute tier, mm -hmm. and then there's the serverless compute tier. Mm -hmm. And it's the serverless compute tier that is best price and performance optimized for the kinds of usage patterns that we've been talking about. Mm. Um, what it does is auto scales uh, compute for the workload mm. so that the resources that the workload needs are delivered only when the application actually request them. Oh, got it. Um, and uh, during the whole time that uh, the application is consuming those resources, mm -hmm. the service is only charging for the amount that's actually used, and it's charging on a per second basis. There's a further price optimization benefit with serverless, mm -hmm. wherein if the database is inactive mm -hmm. for long enough, then the service automatically pauses the database at which point the compute spins down, there's no charge for that compute, uh, and what's left over in terms of the bill is just uh, the amount of storage that's actually being used. Wow, so, so the service effectively allocates the resources kind of on demand, and I only pay for the resources that I use, right? That's right. So um, how is serverless different than from, you had mentioned, uh, provision compute mm -hmm. options in Azure SQL Database? Right, so in the provision compute tier, uh, the amount of resource that's allocated for a database is fixed, mm -hmm. uh, as well as um, the, the price. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, if the database is uh, configured to have four V cores of mm -hmm. compute, then the database in that tier will pay for four V cores, mm -hmm. independent of what the actual usage happens to be. Mm -hmm. So with these patterns where the usage is intermittent and unpredictable, mm -hmm. Um, or relatively low, uh, the serverless tier is often a better fit. Got it, got it. So it sounds like though that uh, if you have provisioned compute but you've got these intermittent workloads that there may be the risk of say over-provisioning. That's right. Is that right? Yeah, so in the kind of patterns we've been talking about where um, there's very little usage and then these sort of sudden bursts of activity, mm -hmm. you could try to use the provision compute tier, and many customers do. Um, but to price optimize, you would have to predict ahead of time what that workload pattern is. Mm -hmm. You can rescale within the uh, provision compute tier to try to follow that, that workload pattern, but it becomes difficult to sort of stay ahead of that. Yeah. Um, so serverless takes care of all of that for you. Got it, got it. So if I could just kind of tie a bow on this, um, provision compute and serverless are really 
kind of designed to meet some different needs, right? That's right. So, so for example, serverless then would be best for, say, um, single databases that have, let's call it a, a, a bursty usage pattern. Um, but in addition to that, they may have these intermittent periods of just inactivity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, you've got uh, single databases for, say, new apps where you uh, really don't know what the, the, the uh, compute requirements are. That's right. Um, on the other hand, you've got provisioned compute, which uh, would be, say, best for databases that have, um, say, a more uniform usage pattern or perhaps uh, more substantial compute utilization over time, right? What happens when I have, say, multiple databases that uh, exhibit the same type of bursty usage pattern? Uh, would I consider a serverless option for, to, for those, or, or would I look at, say, elastic pools, which is a provisioned option? Yeah, no, if, it's a good question. If you have multiple databases, mm -hmm. um, maybe even for the same application, mm -hmm. like a lot of SaaS ISVs do, mm -hmm. there could be hundreds or even thousands of databases, then typically, and in general, um, elastic pools continue to provide the best price optimization benefit. Got it, got it. You know, Morgan, you had mentioned earlier uh, per second billing. Uh, that's different from how we typically bill uh, on our pre provision compute options, right? Uh, which is by the hour. Can you provide an example of what this looks like with a real world example? You bet. Let's take a line of business application. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the employee uh, expense reporting and reimbursement system okay. that we spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, let's look at a 24-hour period um, of usage history of that workload um, as reflected by the first chart, uh, which shows that during those first 12 hours, the database uh, is actually paused. Mm -hmm. There's no compute being provided because it doesn't need compute during those 12 hours. Right. During that time, there's um, no compute bill that accrues for the customer for that workload, and that's reflected by the chart below. Mm -hmm. um, no, no vCore seconds accumulated over that period of time. Um, then you get midway through that day, and uh, suppose there's a burst in act of activity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in this example, we've configured serverless to allow bursting up to four vCores. Mm -hmm. So when that activity resumes, uh, the service is automatically scaling uh, resources up to four vCores on behalf of that workload, as you can see in the usage chart, and correspondingly charging for um, uh, that, the amount of compute that's actually used. Okay. Now, to uh, estimate the total amount of compute uh, billed over that 24-hour period, just have to accumulate um, the number of vCores used over that period, which has units of vCore seconds, and that's reflected by uh, or that's shown as 46,000 roughly uh, okay. vCore seconds in, in that lower graph. And so 46,000 vCore seconds times the, the vCore unit price per second, which is fractions of a penny, mm -hmm. uh, works out to about $3.50 for the day. So wow. the bottom line here is if you compare $3.50 mm -hmm. for the um, ability to burst up to four vCores and compare that against the cost and the provision compute tier for four V cores, mm -hmm. the price savings are rather substantial. Got it. Got it. You know that 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 seems pretty straightforward, but I imagine there's quite a bit that's going on underneath the hood to enable all of this. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. You bet. Um, so in terms of the architecture, uh, there's essentially three tiers. Mm -hmm. There's uh, the tier uh, in the control plane that's responsible for managing connectivity. Um, as well as management operations of the database. Mm -hmm. um, then there's the back end tier uh, called the data plane that actually contains the compute for the database. Mm -hmm. And then uh, below that compute tier, there's the storage tier where the database files uh, actually reside. So imagine, uh, by way of example, that uh, database is paused. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, it, uh, its activity uh, begins again, it resumes. What happens is uh, a login uh, gets received by the gateway in the control plane, mm -hmm. and uh, the control plane determines that the database is indeed paused, and uh, reaches out to the service fabric, mm -hmm. which is sort of in a sense managing the, the data plane, to reactivate or resume that database. Okay. 
And what happens in that process is to first initialize a SQL Server instance, which is the compute that actually uh, uh, manages the workload, mm -hmm. um, and then attach the database files that are stored in the storage tier to that database. And when that whole process completes, when the resume uh, episode finishes, the database is, is online again and able to, to process requests. Now, during the course of being online as the database is processing requests, the service is constantly analyzing the usage history of the database. And as the, the, the workload uh, begins to quiesce a little bit or quiet down in terms of its demands, the service takes opportunities to reclaim resources, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like memory, for example. This is important to control costs, uh, which we then pass on to cost savings for the customer. That's fantastic, and it's great to see how Azure is really innovating in this space to address real-world problems that our customers face and to help them address them in a, a very cost-effective manner. You know, I'd, I'd like to thank you, Morgan, for, for joining us today and, and telling us a bit more about this, this fantastic uh, serverless option that we have in Azure SQL Database. Thanks for having me, Eric. Absolutely, and you know, as a, as a quick reminder, a SQL Database serverless is a compute tier of Azure SQL Database, which, which means in addition to all the per second billing, the automatic scaling that, that Morgan had mentioned, you also benefit from the fact that it's a fully managed service, uh, that it has the built-in intelligence to help you optimize performance and security, and it also has the built-in HA with up to a 4.9's SLA, and we're just getting started. There's, there's a ton more under the hood for Azure SQL Database. So, We'd like to thank you for joining us today and thank you again, Morgan. And we hope you learned a lot and are ready to give it a try. You know, what we'd invite you to do is to, to learn more about uh, SQL Database Serverless is to visit aka.ms slash sqldb underscore serverless and go to the Azure portal and spin up a serverless database for yourself. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks everybody.